Hi, my name is Tal Rabin, and I'll be talking about multi-party computations for the years in the making. So let's start a little bit towards the end of these 40 years and not at the beginning. We have now know that privacy is important. Maybe we knew this in the past also, but now it's being um, highlighted and regulators, in fact, are demanding it with all kinds of regulations like HIPAA that can't share medical data, GDPR, which discusses many, many broad issues of um, privacy in Europe, and more and more, I just put here three examples, but in fact, privacy legislation is coming out all over the world and is really um, demanding that data of individuals remain private. However, sharing of data is also important. Many applications are better when they are able to share data. Just as one example, scientific research. You have two hospitals that are examining um, some disease. And in order to get better information about the disease, they want to exchange data. One has a very unique patient related to this disease in hospital one, and another hospital has another patient like that. These patients are rare, and unless they combine the data, they really cannot get the maximum in order to achieve um, better treatments, medications, and so on. And these things are for the better of society. However, because of all these regulations, we cannot share the data. So the question is, what do we do? It looks like we're stuck between privacy and benefits to society, and one is killing the other. So can we do anything? So is this really the end of the story? Can we not share this information and not gain the benefits that we want? So luckily for us, it's not the end of the story. And let me start by telling you another story. We have Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and each one has a salary. And they want to know the sum of their salaries. Okay, they want to know how much they all earn together. Of course, a very simple solution is Alice says, I earn X, Bob says, I earn Y, and Charlie says, I earn Z, and they sum up this information and they learn the sum of the salary. However, they don't want to do that. They don't want to expose their salaries for various reasons, doesn't matter what the reasons are. They only want to learn the sum of the salaries. So as I said, they want to do this, but they do not want to share their individual salary. So the question is, can we do this? Can we actually have Alice, Bob, and Charlie compute this without exposing, exposing their salaries? This seems quite amazing and unbelievable. Okay, so let's start slowly and see what we can do. Alice earns 150, Bob 120, and Charlie earns 170. What is each party going to do? Alice, locally, on her computer, is going to take her 150, which is her salary, and split it into three numbers that she's going to choose randomly, except for the restriction that the sum of the numbers needs to be 150. And if I didn't do any mistakes, these three numbers um, sum up to 150. And because I, sometimes I'm very bad in math, in fact, I use the calculator, so I know that all the computations in this talk are correct. Okay. Alice does this locally on her computer, still doesn't do anything else. Bob does the same for 120, splits it into these numbers, and Charlie does the same. So they each have a split of their salary into three randomly looking numbers. The only restriction is that the sum is their salary. And I want to draw your attention to the case of Charlie. Even though the number here is 170, 
This number really doesn't reveal anything about her salary because you don't know what the other two numbers are. So even if you expose that number sort of in this computation, it really doesn't reveal anything because the random of creating the split of three numbers should have been random. Okay. Now, as I said, they're chosen completely in random and every number, each individual number does not reveal anything about the original salary of the party. Now, what do they do? How do they continue? Alice takes her three numbers. She holds on to one of them, the 640. She gives Bob the 100 and she gives Charlie the minus 590. Bob does the same, takes the 360, gives it to Alice, holds the minus 510, and gives the 270 to Charlie, and Charlie does the same thing, okay? And now, each one locally computes the sum of the three numbers that it has. So Alice gets 1200, Bob gets minus 240, and Charlie gets minus 520, okay? You should observe that these numbers are completely random. They really have no connection, not to, to Alice's salary, not to Bob's and not to Charlie, because they're just sort of a mixing up of the uh, numbers that were um, chosen by Alice. And the minute that one number is random in the sequence, everything is random. But in fact, Bob and Charlie did the same thing. So these numbers expose nothing about any one person's salary. And now they continue. I've moved this thing. They have these numbers. And now let's look at the following calculation. Alice had 150 in her original, that's her original salary, but her computed value is 1,200. She tells everybody the number 1,200. Bob had 120 and now has minus 240. He announces the minus 240. And Charlie does the same thing. So everybody exposes these values, these intermittent calculations that they've done. And what's the magical thing? The magical thing is that when you add these numbers, you get 440, which is exactly the sum of their salaries. So here, through this magical process, we manage to learn the sum, 440, but we know nothing about any one of the individual salaries. Of course, some information is leaked. Alice, whose salary is 150, knows that um, uh, Bob and Charlie's salaries together are 290. That's okay. But she doesn't know the individual salary of each one of the other parties. So we've really managed to create some secret computation we're able to add numbers in a way that does not expose what the input was. So we see that an interesting problem is emerging. What is this interesting problem? We have a set of parties, before it was Alice, Bob, and Charlie, but we can say any number of parties, P1 up to Pn, and can be whatever number is needed. And each party has a secret input, xi. And really what we want to do is to compute a function of these inputs while preserving the privacy of the, the inputs so that nobody learns anything about the inputs of the other parties beyond what they could learn from the output of the function and their own input. For example, as I said before, Alice does learn the sum of the salaries of Bob and Charlie, but she doesn't learn the individual salary. So this is a general question now. We formulate it in a general way. Can we compute any function privately on the inputs of parties? And the question is, is it um, possible? And to this, we have a theorem. And as you can see, these results started in the early 80s, towards the end of the early, uh, to, towards the end of the 80s, 82 and so on, up to 89. And what these works show is that we can compute a multi-party function. This is what I described above, f of x1 up to xn, 
there exists a protocol that can compute it securely, meaning that it preserves the privacy of the inputs. And these works started this area 40 years ago and were the five um, seminal results in this area. But since then, there have been many, many papers that improve on these results and show more specific functions and how to do more efficiently and different models and so on. But it's been a very flourishing area of research. But you see that this theorem that tells us that we can compute any function means that, in fact, the two hospitals can compute whatever they want on their, pri on their personal inputs, and the inputs will remain private. So in fact, we can achieve both things. We can both provide privacy to the input while still being able to compute the functions that we want on these inputs, gaining the advantage of the combined knowledge. So what do we need in order to do this thing? What are functions that are needed in order to compute any function? You need addition and you need multiplication. With these two operations, you can compute any function. It gives you whatever you need. So we're halfway there, right? I already showed you that we can add. Now I only need to show you that we can also multiply. And then once we have these two things, in fact, we can compute any function. So now, what do we want to do? We had 150, 120, and 170, and we wanted to add, but let's see what we do in order to achieve multiplication. In this case, I'm going to simplify a little bit just for notation. I'm assuming that not all three parties have inputs, but only Alice and Bob. Alice has an A, Bob has a B, Charlie has no input. So Alice takes her share and splits it into A1, A2, and A3. Charlie is still going to participate in this computation, even though she doesn't have an input for this one. Because you can think if it's a big function, Charlie's input could be going into another um, gate where some operation is being computed. But here we're only going to compute A times B. So Alice takes A and splits it into A1, A2, and A3. And Bob splits his number into B1, B2, B3, the same way as we did before. And despite the fact that Charlie does not have a split, she still gets A3 and B3. Um, Alice has A1 and B1, Bob has A2 and B2, because Alice gave Bob A2 and she gave Charlie A3, and Bob did the same thing. So now they have this split of A and B, and what do we want to do? We want to compute A times B. So this is just the mathematical function. What do we have? Sigma AI, this is equal to A, and this is equal to B. So of course, um, this is equal to A times B. And on the right side, we have all the pairs of the multiplications. Um, A1, B1, A1, B2, and so on. This is the sigma that I wrote on the right. And we want to compute this in a privacy-preserving manner, the same way that we did with the additions. However, multiplication is not as simple as addition. You remember that from grade school when you learned, right? Adding was simple, but multiplying was a step up. It was a little harder um, uh, to learn how to multiply. And in fact, also in these multi-party computations, when you want to compute A times B, it's going to be a little bit more complex. And now I'm going to have uh, two slides that have a little bit of math on them um, uh, in a more detailed way, but still I'm not going to go too deep, but I'm sort of going to want to give you 
the sense of how this is uh, done. And in fact, in order to provide the solution for the multiplication, we will also be slightly modifying how we do addition. It's not going to be in that simple, straightforward way. So what do we do? We have, we create um, two polynomials. We create a polynomial. I see that there's an index missing here. Okay. Let me go to this slide. Um, player P1, who's going to be sharing the number A, creates a polynomial whose constant term is A. And party P2 creates a polynomial whose constant term is B. Okay? And here you can see this is basically a polynomial. And this is another polynomial. And this value here, the place where the polynomial intersects the y-axis, is A. This is this value, and this value here is B. I don't know why these were not deleted. And this basically are two polynomials. And what do we know um, from the math? That if we take F1 of X plus F2 of X, then this is equal to some polynomial F of X, and we know that f at 0 equals a plus b. So we can get this polynomial and we can interpolate it. If parties give us their points on the polynomial, we can interpolate the polynomial. This is a little bit more advanced than just doing a sum, but it is also quite straightforward. Okay, so we know how to add. We still, we didn't do um, much more. Um, but we achieved the same solution that we had before when we were able to add. But now we need to multiply. We want to compute A times B. Okay? So let's look at these two polynomials. We still have these two polynomials whose constant term of F1 is still A. It's the same polynomials as before. And the constant term of F2 is B. It's still these two um, polynomials that lie here on the graph. And we really want to compute the multiplication. Okay? So let's look the same way that we did before. Before we said F of X was F1 of X plus F2 of X. And this meant that it was in fact F at zero equaled a plus b. The multiplications of polynomials also satisfies this problem. This f1 times f2, which are the ones with a and b, these two, their product, f at 0, is in fact a times b. So it looks like we really, without much problem, we really achieved what we needed. But the fact of the matter is that things here are not that simple, and that's why I said that multiplication is more involved. In the first part, when you add two polynomials whose degree is t, degree is t, then you get a polynomial whose degree is t. And we always need to maintain for our protocols, I'm not giving you the details, but we need to maintain that the polynomial is of degree t. But what happens when we multiply two polynomials of degree t? Then we move to a situation that the degree of this polynomial is 2t. And this we need to fix. And that is why the protocol is much more involved for multiplication. But all that I will tell you here at this point is that we can do it. It's a... Uh, a special protocol that enables you um, to multiply the polynomials and come back to a situation where you have a polynomial of degree t whose constant term is a plus b. So these are the techniques really that enable us to do this multi-party computations and to compute any function and by this um, to provide privacy. So I want to touch on uh, 
something that now is very, very interesting to people, which also benefits from these things. It's maybe, uh, a, some pe for some people it might be more important, but maybe it's not as important as the question of privacy, but this really does yield to solutions for other things that you may want. If you um, are a person who has a lot of cryptocurrencies, you need to hold them in some wallet. And what does it mean that you have a wallet? It means that you have a secret key, which is used in order to create signatures for transactions. When you want to buy, uh, when you want to sell, to move tokens and so on, you need to um, create a transaction and sign it using the secret key. If you're a very, very lucky person and you have 100 Bitcoins, this is a lot of money. And this key is really very, very important. If you lose this, this key, you lose the Bitcoins, okay? So you don't really want to keep this secret, this secret key in a place where somebody can attack it, right? If this is your wallet on your phone, right? You don't want the key to be in here, your secret key because you might lose it, okay? So what, do you, what would you want to do? You would want to take this secret key and split it up. Take the secret key, like Alice split her salary, and split it into secret key one plus secret key two plus secret key three, okay? And now you'll take these three keys and you'll split them up. Instead of having SK here, you'll have SK1 here. And on your computer, you'll have, it's the keyboard, you'll have SK2, okay? And in some other place, maybe you have um, some uh, disk on key, you'll have SK3, okay? Now your key is, much more secure. If somebody breaks into your phone, all they can see is SK1, right? They can't learn your secret key. You're not going to lose it. And now, think about what we want to do. We want to create a signature, signature, that takes as input SK and the transaction which you want to sign, okay? This is a function. This is a function that can be computed by three parties, by your phone, by your computer, and by your disk on key. Let's say the disk on key has some processor. And we know that this computation will preserve the privacy of your secret key. So in fact, we now have a way to enable, to do things that enhance even your private information, not just if you want to share with other people, you can take your private information, break it up and create it sort of into three entities. And these three entities will compute this function, a function signature that uses, um, and now I'll write it as signature of SK1, SK2, SK3, and the transaction. And now we simple do a, simply do a multi-party computation to compute this signature. Just as a point of information, not that it's important, when we talk about um, uh, computing signatures, we call it threshold cryptography and not multi-party computations, but threshold cryptography, of course, is a sub-area of multi-party computations. So here in black, I wrote exactly what I wrote in red. You take the, the key, you store it in three different locations, and you can even do um, uh, improved techniques that you only need two keys in order to sign, but that really is much more um, advanced um, things in threshold crypto. So to conclude, what do I want to say? First of all, I want to say that theoretical research is important. Look at the 
these questions that were introduced 40 years ago in a completely theoretical manner. It was a, just a theoretical challenge. Can we compute functions by distributed parties without um, exposing information? And a lot of theory was built. And then at some point, it really comes and plays a critical role in things that suddenly society needs. So this is sort of a pitch for why really research, even pure research, can have big impact later. And specifically for the topic that I was talking here today, using this theory, we can actually show that we can do the best of both worlds. That we can um, uh, share information and compute on it while preserving the privacy of the data. So that is it, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for your insights on multi-party communication and um, preserving data privacy. I, whenever I hear a talk like yours, I always feel like I'm at a magic show. It's just wonderful. <laughs> um, and I think you've also touched on, um, you know, data privacy is a very um, important consideration in data science in particular uh, when it comes to ethics of data science. That's absolutely crucial. Um, but uh, let's see if we have some questions from the audience. Um, let me start with one which is uh, uh, technology uh, has changed a lot over the past 40 years. And how do you see this as changing the whole problem of multi-party computation? I, I responded in writing, but I'll say it as well here because it's really critical. When we were looking at these things at the end of the 80s, even throughout the 90s, we thought that it's very, very interesting theory but the computations were heavy, and we didn't think that we could actually implement these things. But then at the beginning of the 2000s, people really started saying, but why not? And groups started sprouting that took these uh, protocols, um, maybe focused them a little bit, said, yes, we'll do a, a subset of functions, but we'll manage to do it. And since then, in the past 20 years, it's really become unbelievable of what advancements we have and that actually we can do multi-party computations, that it's feasible. And I think that the privacy legislation will drive these things much further because it's just going to be, there's going to be no other way to do things but through multi-party computations. Cool. Um, let's see, I have another question. I have been told, uh, have you seen an increase of this type of multi-party computation in the industries or segments you've mentioned, healthcare, finance, crypto, et cetera? Are any industries slow to adopt multi-party communication? So, first of all, what I can say for sure is that people care much more about their money than their health <laughs> because the cryptocurrency industry is adopting it. I mean, that whole industry, right? Bitcoin came out in uh, 2009, which is now 13 years, and uh, distributed wallets, um, uh, custodials, and so on, which need everything that I call the threshold cryptography, are thriving, and people are using. The healthcare industry is advancing a little slower. But it's not just um, to make fun of it and to say that people care more about their money than their health. There is no question that computing the specific functions that are needed in the cryptocurrencies, they're much simpler than doing some computation that's privacy preserving on medical data. So it's also the complexity, the level of complexity of the problem of trying to solve it in the healthcare industry which is slowing things down. But for example, um, for specific things, you can actually do something. There is um, competition which is done every year, which is called IDASH, 
I participated in it twice, and they give you a specific problem to solve and to see how fast you can do it. In one of the years that I participated, there was a question of how to um, check if um, genomes are the same, some in some stretch if there is the same, and to really do it fast. And we had unbelievable speeds, seconds. So if, if you're tailoring something, to the, a specific problem, you will get much better results. And I think that this is going to be the direction that things go in as it relates to health. Cool. Um, I see that I had a changing order here of uh, questions. What does the future of multi-party computation look like? What potential are we not yet tapping into? I guess that's the next research paper. So uh, I think that really sort of this next upcoming 10 years are to take the techniques that we have, the theoretical results, and really push them into practice, into solutions that help people. There is still so much work to be done from the theoretical results in the 80s to today. There has been a huge jump in improvement but there's more to be done. We really need to take another um, jump forward in making these things practical. And I think that this is the upcoming uh, uh, challenge for the next 10 years. If we want to utilize uh, medical information and be sure that we get all the benefits of it, as I described at the beginning. Do I have time for one more question or are we now at an... Yes, I have time. Hurrah! So, <laughs> last question. Do you have any resources that you could share if someone wanted to team uh, to learn more about multi-party com computation? Um, so, it, it depends how, uh, are you a computer science person or not a computer science person? I find that for um, people who don't really want all the technical details that Sometimes looking at Wikipedia is a good source. You can find there quite a bit of um, uh, quality information, not in depth technically. And if you're really interested in something more technical, you could always write to me and I can share this information for sure. And I know you said no more questions, so I do want to say something, Susan, in relation to what you said. Okay. That this looks like magic. Cryptography is magic. There's no question about it. Cryptography can achieve things um, that we cannot achieve in normal in normal um, uh, physic in the physical world, and sometimes it's absolutely mind-boggling that you can do what can be done with cryptography. And multi-party computation definitely is such example, but the area is just filled with these things. So if you want to be awed and amazed, uh, learn more about cryptography. 